This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, The Romantic Egotist. Chapter Four, Narcissus Off Duty. Part Three. Amory is resentful. Slowly and inevitably, yet with a sudden surge at the last, while Amory talked and dreamed, war rolled swiftly up the beach and washed the sands where Princeton played. Every night the gymnasium echoed as platoon after platoon swept over the floor and shuffled out the basketball markings. When Amory went to Washington the next weekend, he caught some of the spirit of crisis, which changed to repulsion in the Pullman car coming back for the berths across from him were occupied by stinking aliens, Greeks, he guessed, or Russians. He thought how much easier patriotism had been to a homogeneous race, how much easier it would have been to fight as the colonies fought, or as the Confederacy fought. And he did no sleeping that night, but listened to the aliens' guffaw and snore while they filled the car with the heavy scent of latest America. In Princeton everyone bantered in public and told themselves privately that their deaths at least would be heroic. The literary students read Rupert Brooke passionately. The lounge lizards worried over whether the government would permit the English-cut uniform for officers. A few of the hopelessly lazy wrote to the obscure branches of the War Department, seeking an easy commission and a soft berth. Then, after a week, Amory saw Byrne, and knew at once that the argument would be futile. Byrne had come out as a pacifist. The socialist magazines, a great smattering of Tolstoy, and his own intense longing for a cause that would bring out whatever strength lay in him, had finally decided him to preach peace as a subjective ideal. When the German army entered Belgium, he began, if the inhabitants had gone peaceably about their business, the German army would have been disorganized in— I know, Amory interrupted, I've heard it all but I'm not going to talk propaganda with you. There's a chance that you're right, but even so we're hundreds of years before the time when non-resistance can touch us as a reality. But, Amory, listen. Byrne, we'd just argue. Very well. Just one thing. I don't ask you to think of your family or friends, because I know they don't count a pecune with you beside your sense of duty. But, Byrne, how do you know that the magazines you read and the societies you join— and these idealists you meet aren't just plain Germans. Some of them are, of course. How do you know they aren't all pro-German, just a lot of weak ones, with German-Jewish names? That's the chance, of course, he said slowly. How much or how little I'm taking this stand because of propaganda I've heard, I don't know. Naturally, I think that it's my most innermost conviction. It seems a path spread before me just now. Amory's heart sank. But think of the cheapness of it. No one's really going to martyr you for being a pacifist. It's just going to throw you in with the worst. I doubt it, he interrupted. Well, it all smells of Bohemian New York to me. I know what you mean, and that's why I'm not sure I'll agitate. You're one man, Byrne, going to talk to people who won't listen with all God's given you. That's what Stephen must have thought many years ago. But he preached his sermons and they killed him. He probably thought as he was dying what a waste it all was. But you see, I've always felt that Stephen's death was the thing that occurred to Paul on the road to Damascus, and sent him to preach the word of Christ all over the world. Go on. That's all. This is my particular duty. Even if right now I'm just a pawn, just sacrificed. God! Amory, you don't think I like the Germans. Well, I can't say anything else. I get to the end of all the logic about non-resistance, and there, like an excluded middle, stands the huge spectre of man, as he is and will always be. And this spectre stands right beside the one logical necessity of Tolstoy's, and the other logical necessity of Nietzsche's. Amory broke off suddenly. When are you going? I'm going next week. I'll see you, of course. As he walked away it seemed to Amory that the look in his face bore a great resemblance to that in Carey's, when he had said good-bye under Blair Arch two years before. Amory wondered unhappily why he could never go into anything with the primal honesty of those two. "'Burns a fanatic,' he said to Tom, "'and he's dead wrong, 
and I'm inclined to think just an unconscious pawn in the hands of anarchist publishers and German-paid rag-wavers. But he haunts me, just leaving everything worth while. Byrne left in a quietly dramatic manner a week later. He sold all his possessions and came down to the room to say good-bye, with a battered old bicycle on which he intended to ride to his home in Pennsylvania. "'Peter the Hermit, bidding farewell to Cardinal Richelieu,' suggested Alec, who was lounging in the window-seat as Byrne and Amory shook hands. But Amory was not in a mood for that, and as he saw Byrne's long legs propel his ridiculous bicycle out of sight beyond Alexander Hall, he knew he was going to have a bad week. Not that he doubted the war. Germany stood for everything repugnant to him, for materialism and the direction of tremendous licentious force. It was just that Byrne's face stayed in his memory, and he was sick of the hysteria he was beginning to hear. "'What on earth is the use of suddenly running down Gotha? he declared to Alec and Tom. "'Why write books to prove he started the war, or that that stupid, overestimated Schiller is a demon in disguise?' "'Have you ever read anything of theirs?' asked Tom shrewdly. "'No,' Amory admitted. "'Neither have I,' he said, laughing. "'People will shout,' said Alec quietly. "'But Goethe's on the same old shelf in the library, to bore any one that wants to read him.' Amory subsided, and the subject dropped. "'What are you going to do, Amory?' "'Infantry or aviation. I can't make up my mind. I hate mechanics, but then, of course, aviation's the thing for me.' "'I feel as Amory does,' said Tom. "'Infantry or aviation? "'Aviation sounds like the romantic side of the war, of course. "'Like cavalry used to be, you know. "'But like Amory, I don't know a horsepower from a piston-rod.' "'Somehow Amory's dissatisfaction with his lack of enthusiasm culminated "'in an attempt to put the blame for the whole war on the ancestors of his generation. "'All the people who cheered for Germany in 1870, "'all the materialists rampant.' all the idolizers of German science and efficiency. So he sat one day in an English lecture, and heard Locksley Hall quoted, and fell into a brown study with contempt for Tennyson and all he stood for, for he took him as a representative of the Victorians. Victorians, Victorians, who never learned to weep, who sowed the bitter harvest that your children go to reap, scribbled Amory in his notebook. The lecturer was saying something about Tennyson's solidity, and fifty heads were bent to take notes. Amory turned over to a fresh page, and began scrawling again. They shuddered when they found what Mr. Darwin was about. They shuddered when the waltz came in, and Newman hurried out. But the waltz came in much earlier. He crossed that out. "'And entitled A Song in the Time of Order,' came the professor's voice droning far away. "'Time of Order! Good Lord!' everything crammed in the box, and the Victorian sitting on the lid smiling serenely, with Browning in his Italian villa crying bravely, "'All's for the best!' Amory scribbled again. "'You knelt up in the temple, and he bent to hear you pray. You thanked him for your glorious gains, reproached him for Cathay. Why could he never get more than a couplet at a time? Now he needed something to rhyme with. "'You would keep him straight with science,' though he had gone wrong before. Well, anyway. You met your children in your home. I fixed it up, you cried. You took your fifty years of Europe, and then virtuously died. That was, to a great extent, Tennyson's idea, came the lecturer's voice. Swinburne's Song in the Time of Order might well have been Tennyson's title. He idealized order against chaos, against waste. At last Amory had it. He turned over another page and scrawled vigorously for the twenty minutes that was left of the hour. Then he walked up to the desk and deposited a page torn out of his notebook. "'Here's a poem to the Victorian, sir,' he said coldly. The professor picked it up curiously while Amory backed rapidly through the door. Here is what he had written. "'Songs in the time of order you left for us to sing, proofs with excluded middles, Answers to life and rhyme, keys of the prison warder and ancient bells to ring. Time was the end of riddles, we were the end of time. Here were domestic oceans and a sky that we might reach, guns and a guarded border, gauntlets but not to fling. 
thousands of old emotions and a platitude for each, songs in the time of order, and tongues that we might sing. THE END OF MANY THINGS Early April slipped by in a haze, a haze of long evenings on the club veranda with the gramophone playing Poor Butterfly inside, for Poor Butterfly had been the song of that last year. The war seemed scarcely to touch them, and it might have been one of the senior springs of the past, except for the drilling every other afternoon. Yet Amory realized poignantly that this was the last spring under the old regime. "'This is the great protest against the Superman,' said Amory. "'I suppose so,' Alec agreed. "'He's absolutely irreconcilable with any utopia. As long as he occurs, there's trouble.' and all the latent evil that makes a crowd list and sway when he talks. And, of course, all that he is is a gifted man without moral sense. That's all. I think the worst thing to contemplate is this. It's all happened before. How soon will it happen again? Fifty years after Waterloo, Napoleon was as much a hero to English schoolchildren as Wellington. How do we know our grandchildren won't idolize von Hindenburg the same way? What brings it about? Time, damn it, and the historian. If we could only learn to look on evil as evil, whether it's clothed in filth or monotony or magnificence. God, haven't we raked the universe over the coals for four years? Then the night came that was to be the last. Tom and Amory, bound in the morning for different training camps, paced the shadowy walks as usual, and seemed to see around them the faces of the men they knew. The grass is full of ghosts tonight. The whole campus is alive with them. They paused by little, and watched the moon rise, to make silver of the slate roof of Dodd and blue the rustling trees. "'You know,' whispered Tom, "'what we feel now is the sense of all the gorgeous youth that has rioted through here in two hundred years.' A last burst of singing flooded up from Blair Arch, broken voices for some long parting. "'And what we leave here is more than this class.' It's the whole heritage of youth. We're just one generation. We're breaking all the links that seem to bind us here to top-booted and high-stock generations. We've walked arm in arm with Burr and Light Horse Harry Lee through half these deep blue nights. That's what they are, Tom tangented off. Deep blue. A bit of color would spoil them, make them exotic. Spires against a sky that's a promise of dawn and blue light on the slate roofs. It hurts, rather. "'Good-bye, Aaron Burr,' Amory called toward deserted Nassau Hall. "'You and I knew strange corners of life.' His voice echoed in the stillness. "'The torches are out,' whispered Tom. "'Ah, Messalina, the long shadows are building minarets on the stadium.' For an instant the voices of freshman years surged around them, and then they looked at each other with faint tears in their eyes. Damn! Damn! The last light fades and drifts across the land, the low, long land, the sunny land of spires, the ghosts of evening, tune again their lyres, and walk singing in a plaintive band down the long corridors of trees. Pale fires echo the night from tower top to tower, O oh, sleep that dreams, and dream that never tires, Press from the petals of the lotus flower, Something of this to keep, the essence of an hour. No more to wait the twilight of the moon, In this sequestered veil of star and spire, For one eternal morning of desire passes to time, And earthly afternoon. Here, Heraclitus, did you find in fire and shifting things The prophecy you hurled down the dead years? This midnight my desire will see, shadowed among the embers, furled in flame, the splendor and the sadness of the world. Interlude May 1917 to February 1919 A letter dated January 1918, written by Monsignor Darcy to Amory, who is a second lieutenant in the 171st Infantry, Port of Embarkation, Camp Mills, Long Island. My dear boy, all you need tell me of yourself is that you still are. For the rest, I merely search back in a restive memory. 
a thermometer that records only fevers, and match you with all that I was at your age. But men will chatter, and you and I will still shout our futilities to each other across the stage, until the last silly curtain falls, plump, upon our bobbing heads. But you are starting the spluttering magic lantern show of life, with much the same array of slides as I had, so I need to write to you, if only to shriek the colossal stupidity of people. This is the end of one thing. For better or worse, you will never again be quite the Amory Blaine that I knew. Never again will we meet as we have met, because your generation is growing hard, much harder than mine ever grew, nourished as they were on the stuff of the nineties. Amory, lately I read Aeschylus, and there, in the divine irony of the Agamemnon, I find the only answer to this bitter age. All the world tumbled about our ears, and the closest parallel ages, back in that hopeless resignation. There are times when I think of the men out there as Roman legionaries, miles from their corrupt city, stemming back the hordes, hordes a little more menacing, after all, than the corrupt city. Another blind blow at the race, furies that we passed with ovation years ago, over whose corpses we bleated triumphantly all through the Victorian era. And afterward, an out-and-out -out materialistic world, and the Catholic Church. I wonder where you'll fit in. Of one thing I'm sure. Celtic you'll live, and Celtic you'll die. So if you don't use heaven as a continual referendum for your ideas, you'll find earth a continual recall to your ambitions. Amory, I've discovered suddenly that I'm an old man. Like all old men, I've had dreams sometimes, and I'm going to tell you of them. I've enjoyed imagining that you were my son, that perhaps when I was young I went into a state of coma and begat you, and when I came to had no recollection of it. It's the paternal instinct, Amory. Celibacy goes deeper than the flesh. Sometimes I think that the explanation of our deep resemblance is some common ancestor, and I find that the only blood that the Darcys and the O'Haras have in common is that of the O'Donohues. Stephen was his name, I think. When the lightning strikes one of us, it strikes both. You had hardly arrived at the port of embarkation when I got my papers to start for Rome, and I am waiting every moment to be told where to take ship. Even before you get this letter, I shall be on the ocean. Then will come your turn. You went to war as a gentleman should, just as you went to school and college, because it was the thing to do. It's better to leave the blustering and tremulo heroism to the middle classes. They do it so much better. Do you remember that weekend last March, when you brought Burn Holiday from Princeton to see me? What a magnificent boy he is! It gave me a frightful shock afterward when you wrote that he thought me splendid. How could he be so deceived? Splendid is the one thing that neither you nor I are. We are many other things. We're extraordinary. We're clever. We could be said, I suppose, to be brilliant. We can attract people. We can make atmosphere. We can almost lose our Celtic souls in Celtic subtleties. We can almost always have our own way. But splendid, rather not. I am going to Rome with a wonderful dossier and letters of introduction that cover every capital in Europe, and there will be no small stir when I get there. How I wish you were with me! This sounds like a rather cynical paragraph. Not at all the sort of thing that a middle-aged clergyman should write to a youth about to depart for the war. The only excuse is that the middle-aged clergyman is talking to himself. There are deep things in us, and you know what they are as well as I do. We have great faith, though yours at present is uncrystallized. We have a terrible honesty that all our sophistry cannot destroy, and above all a childlike simplicity that keeps us from ever being really malicious. I have written a keen for you which follows. I am sorry your cheeks are not up to the description I have written of them, but you will smoke and read all night. At any rate, here it is. A lament for a foster son, and he going to the war against the king of foreign. A cone. He is gone from me the son of my mind, and he in his golden youth like Angus Ogre, Angus of the bright birds, and his mind strong and subtle, like the mind of Cuculin, on Myrthim. A weir us through. 
His brow is as white as the milk of the cows of Maeve, And his cheeks like the cherries of the tree, And it bending down to Mary, And she feeding the Son of God. Avilia Vron His hair is like the golden collar of the kings at Terra, And his eyes like the four grey seas of Aaron, And they swept with the mists of rain. Mavrona Gogudio He to be in the joyful and red battle, Amongst the chieftains, and they doing great deeds of valour, His life to go from him, It is the cords of my own soul would be loosed. Avish Dilish My heart is in the heart of my son, And my life is in his life surely. A man can be twice young, In the life of his sons only. Jir du Vaha Alanav May the Son of God be above him and beneath him, before him and behind him. May the King of the Elements cast a mist over the eyes of the King of Foreign. May the Queen of the Graces lead him by the hand the way he can go through the midst of his enemies, and they not seeing him. May Patrick of the Gale and Column of the Churches, and the five thousand saints of Aaron, be better than a shield to him, and he got into the fight. Ach, Akone. Amory, Amory, I feel somehow that this is all. One or both of us is not going to last out this war. I have been trying to tell you how much this reincarnation of myself in you has meant in the last few years. Curiously alike we are, curiously unalike. Good-bye, dear boy, and God be with you. Thayer Darcy Embarking at Night Amory moved forward on the deck until he found a stool under an electric light. He searched in his pocket for notebook and pencil, and then began to write, slowly, laboriously. We leave tonight. Silent, we fill the still, deserted street. A column of dim grey, and ghosts rose startled at the muffled beat along the moonless way. The shadowy shipyards echoed to the feet that turned from night and day. And so we linger on the windless decks, See on the spectre shore shades of a thousand days, Poor grey-ribbed wrecks. Oh, shall we then deplore those futile years? See how the sea is white. The clouds have broken, and the heavens burn To hollow highways, paved with graveled light. The churning of the waves about the stern Rises to one voluminous nocturne. We leave to-night. A letter from Amory, headed Brest, March 11, 1919, to Lieutenant T. P. Dinvilliers, Camp Gordon, Georgia. Dear Baudelaire, we met in Manhattan on the 30th of this very month. We then proceeded to take a very sporty apartment, you and I and Alec, who is at me elbow as I write. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have a vague dream of going into politics. Why is it that the pick of the young Englishmen from Oxford and Cambridge go into politics? and in the U.S.A. we leave it to the muckers, raised in the ward, educated in the assembly, and sent to Congress, fat-paunched bundles of corruption, devoid of both ideas and ideals, as the political debaters used to say. Even forty years ago we had good men in politics, but we, we are brought up to pile up a million, and show what we are made of. Sometimes I wish I'd been an Englishman. American life is so damned dumb and stupid and healthy." Since poor Beatrice died, I'll probably have a little money, but very darned little. I can forgive Mother almost everything, except the fact that in a sudden burst of religiosity, toward the end, she left half of what remained to be spent in stained-glass windows and seminary endowments. Mr. Barton, my lawyer, writes me that my thousands are mostly in street railways, and that the said street RRs are losing money because of the five-cent fares— Imagine a salary list that gives three hundred and fifty a month to a man that can't read and write. Yet I believe in it, even though I've seen what was once a sizable fortune melt away between speculation, extravagance, the democratic administration, and the income tax. Modern, that's me all over, Mabel. At any rate, we'll have really knockout rooms. You can get a job on some fashion magazine, and Alec can go into the zinc company or whatever it is that his people own. He's looking over my shoulder, and he says it's a brass company. But I don't think it matters much, do you? There's probably as much corruption in zinc-made money as brass-made money. 
As for the well-known Amory, he would write immortal literature, if he were sure enough about anything to risk telling anyone else about it. There is no more dangerous gift to posterity than a few cleverly turned platitudes. Tom, why don't you become a Catholic? Of course, to be a good one you'd have to give up those violent intrigues you used to tell me about. But you'd write better poetry if you were linked up to tall golden candlesticks and long, even chants. And even if the American priests are rather bourgeois, as Beatrice used to say, still you need only go to the sporty churches, and I'll introduce you to Monsignor Darcy, who really is a wonder. Carrie's death was a blow. So was Jessie's to a certain extent. And I have a great curiosity to know what queer corner of the world has swallowed Byrne. Do you suppose he's in prison under some false name? I confess that the war, instead of making me orthodox, which is the correct reaction, has made me a passionate agnostic. The Catholic Church has had its wings clipped so often lately that its part was timidly negligible, and they haven't any good riders any more. I'm sick of Chesterton. I've only discovered one soldier who passed through the much-advertised spiritual crisis, like this fellow, Donald Hankey, and the one I knew was already studying for the ministry, so he was ripe for it. I honestly think that's all pretty much rot, though it seemed to give sentimental comfort to those at home, and may make fathers and mothers appreciate their children. This crisis-inspired religion is rather valueless and fleeting at best. I think four men have discovered Paris to one that discovered God. But us, you and me and Alec, oh, we'll get a Jap butler and dress for dinner and have wine on the table and lead a contemplative, emotionless life until we decide to use machine-guns with the property owners, or throw bombs with the Bolshevik god. Tom, I hope something happens. I'm restless as the devil and have a horror of getting fat or falling in love and growing domestic. The place at Lake Geneva is now for rent, but when I land I'm going west to see Mr. Barton and get some details. Write me care of the Blackstone, Chicago. Sever, dear Boswell. Samuel Johnson End of Book 1, Chapter 4, Part 3